Welcome to lunch, everybody. I hope uh, I hope you're all having a good time. This morning sessions were very were fascinating, um, and we're glad to see you all out here, outside. It's always much better to be outside in Aspen than in the basement of a, of a hotel. Um, now, at lunch today, we are honored to have as our keynote speaker, Mark Ganzi, who is CEO of Digital Bridge. Because Digital Bridge is part of so many aspects of the digital infrastructure, he's really a perfect speaker for this year's Aspen. We'll take questions at the end, but remember, you can use slider to submit the questions. I'll be looking at my phone so I can see them. Now, in a bit more detail, uh, Mark Ganzi is CEO of Digital Bridge and has been an investor and operator in the digital infrastructure sector for more than 25 years. He founded Digital Bridge Holdings in 2013 and built the firm into a leading global manager of digital infrastructure assets with more than 20 billion in assets under management until its merger in July 2019 into the current company, Digital Bridge Group. Previously, he founded Global Tower Partners, which became the, one of the largest privately owned tower companies in the US before being acquired by American Tower Corporation in 2013. Um, and prior to that, he worked as a consulting partner for DB Capital Partners, where he oversaw the institution's investments in the Latin American tower sector. And before that, he co-founded and served as president of Apex Site Management, uh, one of the largest third-party managers of wireless and wireline communication sites in the US. Um, when it eventually merged with SpectraSite Communications to create one of the largest telecommunications site portfolios in the US. Now, not just business, um, but in 1990, Mr. Ganzi served as an assistant commercial attache in Madrid for the US Department of Commerce's Foreign Commercial Service Department. He was a board member of the Wireless Infrastructure Association um, and was chairman of that from 2009 to 2011. Uh, so as you can see, if you want to know something about digital infrastructure, this is the person to ask. Um, and hopefully we'll ask uh, quite a lot. Um, and also Mark's family is here, and it's always nice to have someone care enough that they have bring their family. Um, so Mark, thank you so much for being here. Really, really yeah, appreciate thank it. Thank you, Scott. A pleasure to be here. So uh, Digital Bridge touches really probably just about everyone in the audience, even if you don't realize it, whether as a supplier, a competitor, um, or for policymakers, a company whose products and services are going to determine whether your policy priorities succeed. So before we really get into it, um, tell us a little bit more just about the business, what Digital Bridge does and its role in the infrastructure. Yeah, so we're, you know, I, I like to distill it to maybe the most simplest form, which is we're, we're sort of the dumb plumbing, I guess. Um, we own about 368,000 miles of fiber here in the US. We've got 250,000 macro sites. We have about 48,000 small cells. Um, globally, we own about 450 data centers. So. If you've made a phone call or you've sent a text or you've responded to an email, uh, that form of communication will touch uh, something that we own and operate. So uh, everything that we do on a daily basis today requires um, low latency, high speed connectivity, and our 29 companies globally are, are focused on that, on that, not just here in the US, but we operate now extensively in Asia, have a very large presence in Europe, and then We've been investing in owning and operating in Latin America since the late 90s, so we're a big believer in infrastructure down south as well. So how do you see, do you see from your vantage point effects of the various policies that we've been talking about? Um, you know, the biggest broadband subsidies are yet to come, but there's been a lot so far, and all this talk about the ways government is, is uh, trying to uh, stimulate the sector. Do you see it um, in, in different kinds of what people are, how people, what the orders people put through and, and your... Yeah, we're, we're not seeing it yet. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're seeing it down at, at sort of the street level yet, but um, the implications I think are significant. Um, you know, there's a lot of change that's happening in network infrastructure and there's a lot of change obviously happening not only in wireline technology, but the migration of 5G is probably the biggest step function form change we've seen in network topology and going back all the way, if, you're, if you remember the days of 1996 when we moved from 1G to 2G, I would say this migration path to MIMO, that standard, and ultimately the decentralization of the RAN, of the radio access network, is a massive change in the way RF engineers are designing networks, the way that we're thinking about how to use 5G, the use cases are changing very rapidly, so um, there's a lot of awareness around that catalyst and, and what it's going to do. It then also changes definitionally where we put infrastructure, how do we put infrastructure. Um, it creates a lot of challenges for policymakers because they're, they're trying to keep up as fast as they can. 
And I'm, when I say policymakers, there's a federal overlay, but there's a state overlay, and then there's what I call the state and main overlay, which is local municipalities trying to figure out how to deal with the onslaught of applications that are coming that involve, you know, for, for, for one example, private 5G enterprise networks. Should that be regulated? How do we think about building that infrastructure? And so our businesses are in incredibly uh, dynamic at the moment, and we're responding to how regulators are, are thinking about that. I think on the on the president's initiative around around broadband uh, deployment, it's it's a bold, uh, it's a big, it's a big uh, swing. Um, you know, there's a there's there's sort of that lip to cup execution to use a golf analogy. A lot of money being thrown around. Where does it ultimately end up? How do we create change? And, and ultimately, how does it impact consumers and businesses? And I think this is the real uh, challenge for policymakers and for private enterprise. Um, I look at that bill and I dissect that bill on, on multiple levels, and there's some places I think we've hit it right, and there's some places I think we, we, we need more work. I was gonna say miss, but I don't wanna do that in this room. Um, so what, what are some of those places? So wh where did we get it right? I think the 45 plus billion that's going out to the states that the NTIA is distributing is, is inevitably the right uh, path for that money. Um, we do need more infrastructure spend at the state level. A lot of that money uh, will be sourced, uh, I think, with the traditional swim lanes, which is mostly the regional bell carriers who are incredibly well established and have great lobbying efforts at the state level. So a lot of that money's already spoken for. We kind of know where that's going. And look, in, in all fairness to the wind streams and the, and the lumens of the world, they've got a massive uh, challenge to overbuild copper infrastructure and bring fiber to homes and fibers to businesses. And a lot of those territories you don't want to serve. So I understand that. I, I feel Jeff Story's pain and, and I feel Tony's pain and, and they're customers of ours and, and, and they need help uh, because there's well-financed private operators that are overbuilding them and there's a lot of competition that's happening. I think this does stimulate the right competitive uh, profile on a, on a state level. The one thing that I like what Alan did in, this, in, that, in that first tier of the spending is there is an opening for education and for jobs. That's really important. We cannot miss that right now. Um, our biggest problem, once again, owning 29 companies globally, I can't get people back to work. I can't get people to, to micro trench ditches. I can't get people to climb poles. I can't get people to build cell towers fast enough. We have a massive labor shortage issue. Supply chains are correcting themselves, but our, our biggest challenge today is keeping up with customer demand. And that, that is, I, I see a lot of people doing this, so I think people agree with what's happening. And we have to find solutions to that. And you and I were talking about it earlier, and there's, this is something I'm particularly passionate about, and I know that we've got to find a, 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 new, a new vocabulary or we've got to find a new dialogue about how we really stimulate our youth to want to go into vocational-based education. And how do we not make that a bad word? Because you and I were talking about vocation training earlier. That Oh, that's community college. No, that shouldn't be in community colleges, actually. There should be degrees for RF engineering. There should be a data center engineering degree. There should be engineering degrees around how we ultimately uh, build fiber and how we build networks. And so this is something that, that we're, we're pretty focused on and, and I hope the NTA will help us in doing some of these things. Um, I know our trade association, the Wireless Industry Association, our former CEO is sitting here in the front row and our current CEO is somewhere out in the audience. There he is right there. So uh, these are two guys that understand infrastructure deeply. And, um, you know, I know when, when I was involved with Jonathan helping drive uh, policy at WIA, uh, we were very focused on jobs. Um, so we initially focused on the military. And so I see there being two really good opportunities to retool our economy. I see our youth and I see our military. Um, you know, um, Warriors for Wireless is a great association. Uh, it's something that we should be driving more money into as our veterans sort of time out and they come in back to the workforce, what a better place to put them in building cell towers and, and micro trenching and, and doing some of the things that we're talking about, we're building data centers. I can't think of the employees that we've hired down at our portfolio companies. We have 29,000 employees across our 29 companies. Our best employees are ex-military, by far, in operations. So people that maintain the infrastructure, people that build the infrastructure, why their profile is suited for that they're mission capable they understand duty they show up on time they work hard these are things that seem to have escaped the american workforce recently um so i, I like people that want to go to work and want to get the mission done and so we've screened 50,000 veterans 
We put 2,000 uh, veterans to work. We could probably put 20,000 veterans to work in the telecommunications industry just on the front lines of building that infrastructure. And so I, I would really love a part of that first tranche of the bill to go towards jobs. So let, let me push a little bit on the, the labor issue because there are a few things. One is, you know, there's a short run problem um, and then there's sort of a longer run problem and, and, and we'll solve, hopefully solve some of the long run problem with some of the educational changes that you're talking about or maybe even medium ter term. But right now, um, it's not, it seems like it's not enough just to train people because the problem is not enough people in the labor market, the labor force. And, you know, do we think about how to encourage people to come back into the labor force or, I mean, or the most immediate way is to allow lots more immigration? And that just doesn't seem popular. It's not popular, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and look, Im immigration can be good. I mean, we've, we've sourced a lot of great RF engineers from places like India and the Middle East. Um, where they're highly educated, uh, they're vastly underpaid in their countries. And look, if Americans aren't gonna take those jobs, then we need you know, next woman up or next man up. Um, I don't think our economy can sit and wait. And so we've, we've had some of those challenges. And immigration's one, one possible lever that we have. Another is you know, through the education system. Um, we've invested, you know, one of our sort of DEI initiatives is impact data. Um, this is a great organization. Um, we're building data centers at historic black colleges and universities. There's 107 of those universities. We think a third of them are ripe uh, for doing it. We're building our first location at Morehouse College. Um, these are 40 to 80,000 square foot data centers. Half of it is um, you know, working with Amazon and Microsoft who are actually putting infrastructure in those data centers. But the other half of it is classrooms and educational tracks and creating that curriculum that's ultimately going to retool the economy and put put young Americans into great jobs. So this is actually one of the interesting. I think one of the interesting things about Digital Bridge is that you've got these different. I don't know whether you call them pillars or I don't know what, but you know you focus on uh, towers, cells, fiber networks, data centers, and edge infrastructure, and they all kind of fit together. So you've got these initiatives. How do they? I mean, how do they? How do they? How are they complementary? Well, I think what's what's unique is we have different businesses that address very surgical parts of the ecosystem, whether it's you know, fiber optic cabling or cell towers or data centers. Um, but the, the sort of overlay uh, is really based on what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. And I think in my, my sort of 29 years of doing this, uh, our customers have changed. And, and where we have found relevance is the ability to sit with customers and ask them, okay, where do you want to go next with your network? And, and having that sort of high level intellectual conversation about what the network looks like and, and how do we put the pieces together is, uh, is, is, our, is our primary challenge as investors and as, as operators. Um, I think what's been a lot of fun is, you know, in the last three to four years, is really thinking about this, this marriage, Scott, between, between cloud and mobility, and um, which gets me to one of the pieces in the $65 billion bill, which is the middle mile and really the definitional change of middle mile and what, what does that pose and how do we redefine it. And if you think about 5G and cloud sort of both going down, you know, sort of two, uh, two highways together, um, they do converge, right? Because ultimately all of the network radio infrastructure that makes 5G work is now cloud-based. So everything that Nokia and Ericsson delivers to AT&T, Verizon and T-Mobile is based on a CRAN or ORAN architecture. And if I'm going too fast, uh, send a text to Scott and I'll answer your question. Um, but the key to this is networks and the way they were built were typically a very linear relationship. You'd have a tower, you'd have a radio, you'd have a set of antennas, you'd have fiber or copper backhauling that to a switch somewhere. That no longer exists. In a 5G architecture, you have a multipath authentication where because of the MIMO standard, MIMO is multiple input, multiple output, which means you can operate one wireless network and you can operate three or four different bands of spectrum from one set of infrastructure. Really unique. So your phone, if you have a 5G phone, your phone can actually work on four different bands of spectrum. And your phone is actually doing four different things at the same time. It's running apps, you're responding to text messages, you're taking a phone call, you're inevitably sending an email, you're opening a PDF, and your phone intelligently, because of the CRAN or ORAN network, is making the spectrum decision for you. You have no choice in that. And so to make that happen, you need the cloud. So this is the first time where the cloud is intersected with mobility. And to make that happen, it's no longer building a 
quarter, you know, $250 million switch in downtown Dallas, you're now, if you're, if you're T-Mobile, you've built 14 RAN hubs around Dallas, of which none of that infrastructure sits in downtown Dallas. It all sits on the edge. So do you consider the cloud part of Middle Mile now? Completely. It's actually seminal to Middle Mile. Mm -hmm. And as we, as, and I think you and I were talking earlier about what is edge computing? How do you find, how do you define edge computing? And I think we're going through that right now. We're trying to create a definitional physical location to where the edge sits. And, and to most people, if you're like, oh, edge computing, that sounds really cool. What does it actually mean? The edge actually is a physical place. It's where data is originated. It's where data comes back. It's where data is stored. And it's where high-powered compute exists. And typically, most of that cloud architecture sits in what are called availability zones. And I think some of the cloud players are here in the room, so that they'll, be, they'll be saying, yes, that's correct. But those AZs are changing, because historically, you've had really two types of compute. You've had ultimately high-powered compute that is fueling applications, and then you have high-powered compute, which is storage. Storage you can put anywhere. You can put it in Reykjavik. You can put it somewhere in the middle of Sweden. That's easy. It's really how do you create low latency compute that's, that's inevitably close to the consumer and the enterprise, and ultimately to devices in a world where we're fastly changing uh, this notion of consumer to consumer to B to C to D to D, device to device. Let's or go back to middle mile for a yeah. minute, because it was an interesting conversation for. By the way, when I'm looking at my phone, I'm not answering emails. I'm trying to look at Slido. I'm, I'm, I'm very engaged here, I, I hope. Um, defining middle mile, as you know, has is, is always been a problem. It, and definitions matter for policy a lot, because that affects what, you know, what, can be, what, a, subs, what a subsidy goes for and what, how you can evaluate whether it's su successful. In various things that I and lots of other people have written about other broadband subsidy programs will write something, and someone will say, no, 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 that's not right, because it was middle mile and you're not using the right metric. The US, what the metric is, and they'll say, well, I have no idea. Um, and well, they're based on old maps. Right. And they're based on old data that's, so, uh, that's a decade old. If so you were, that's the problem. If you were to, to be thinking about a, a public policy for this, which is a totally unfair question because it's not your job, um, what would you include in Middle Mile um, and, and how to know whether you know, it's, it, the, the program is being successful? Well, I think you, you, you have to reassess the Middle Mile because a lot of what's impacting Middle Mile is wireless. And historically, we've been only thinking about it in the context of wireline technology. And you have to reimagine that, and you have to reshape it, because ultimately, network usage has changed. And COVID taught us that, right? Ultimately, where we went to work, how our kids got educated, how we did commerce, all of that changed overnight. Everyone left the big cities. We all flocked out to the suburbs. Many people flocked out to the country. They found out some of those homes had internet, some of those homes didn't have internet. You'd have to get a wireless connectivity, you'd use a dongle or use a hive, or you'd use your cell phone to get connectivity. And everything changed. Usage patterns changed. Use cases changed really fast. And adaptation and migration to all things digital changed. And meanwhile, we're operating on these maps that are, are as I said, antiquated and don't exactly represent where pop density is. But most importantly, where data is being originated and where data is being consumed and where it's being stored. And we're thinking about middle mile was always about connectivity to households. But no one's tracking how much data is being used in the middle mile. And that's really the metric we should be thinking about is where is data being consumed? That's really the definition of where the middle mile needs to be redesigned. And so. We had a billion dollars put in the $65 billion bill for middle mile. That probably at a minimum needs to be 10 billion, minimum. And all of that middle mile should be focused on edge infrastructure. So that's principally dark fiber, that's edge compute sites, which are really um, small data centers or edge, edge data centers or open RAN hubs or CRAN hubs. And you have to begin to start putting wireless metrics into the middle mile because you know, how many people still have in this room a wireline phone at their house today? Okay, very few. Wow. There's a couple of hands, congratulations. <laughs> um, I'm sure AT&T or Windstream or Lumen thanks you. Um, but that's a key point, right? We're operating off of old data, Scott. We need new data and we need new work and we need new grants put out to go do this work. Um, one of the big you know, opportunities that could have been addressed in this bill was dealing with exactly that. There's not enough capital spend in that bill for wireless infrastructure. 
and this, this convergence of wireline and wireless has happened. It's over. So if, if we think that wireless is not a relevant part of our infrastructure, then that was a big miss in the bill. And so I'd put more money into the middle mile. I'd put more work into studying what the middle mile is. And I would create new KPIs and new metrics around the middle mile because our data is antiquated. And ultimately, our, competitive, our competitiveness as a country will rest in our ability to proliferate data on the edge, not data in the CBD. We've got plenty of data centers. We've got plenty of fiber in places like New York City and Los Angeles, Atlanta, and Dallas. You know, the pain points in COVID were candidly places like Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, Aspen, Colorado. Um, not that people will have a lot of sympathy for Aspen, Colorado, uh, but there was really horrible connectivity in COVID here. Um, but we have to start thinking about tier two and tier three markets. We have to think about transport. We have to think about new local loop in terms of how you define ultimate transport inside secondary and tertiary markets. And we have to, um, what gives me hope is that part of that 45 billion that's gonna be appropriate at the state level will go to the RBOX who do have a series of old switching facilities that if you ever walk into one of those things, they're typically massive concrete buildings that had racks and racks and racks of copper switching gear. Now all that copper gear is out. 95% of those buildings are empty. What can we do? We gotta repurpose those. We gotta put money into power. We gotta put money into connectivity. And we've gotta put money into backup facilities so that we can retool those old switches, uh, those old COs into modern day edge compute facilities. So Digital Bridge operates all around the world. Um, how many of the sort of the, t the types of issues that you've been talking about now are specific to the US? How many are, are, are broader, you know, sort of dealing with just industry change, market change? Um, and, uh, you know, how do you, what do you think about the business climate in, in different countries? How do you compare them? Well, I think, look, we, we actually, I, I know it might be hard for this room to stomach, but we actually have a pretty efficient uh, regulatory uh, scheme here. Uh, go to Europe and your, your mind will be blown. Um, but I actually find it's easier to operate here than it is in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I find that uh, parts of Asia are very easy to do business with and some parts are very difficult. You can figure out which one's really difficult. We don't do business there. Um, I would say Latin America is evolving really fast. Uh, we've been down there for over 20 years. We really like the market. Um, wireless adaptation is actually faster there than it is in the US. Um, social media, Latins are incredibly social on their phones, which is good news for us. And, um, and we're building a lot of uh, the things that we were building three or four years ago, Scott, we're now building in Latin America. I always find there's kind of a four to five year lag hmm. between LATAM and the US. So believe it or not, we're still building 4G in many countries in Latin America, places like Peru, Colombia, Chile. They're just now starting to make decisions around their hardware and spectrum in those countries. Spectrum clearing down there is really hard. Uh, it takes a lot longer. Uh, our FCC does a really good job of spectrum clearing. This is my shameless plug for the FCC. Um, we do a good job of clearing spectrum. We do a great job of auctioning spectrum in the US. Other parts of the world, very inefficient. Um, so that's, that's in the plus column for us. Uh, Europe has a host of challenges. I'd say the biggest challenge in Europe today is around data sovereignty mm -hmm. and around power. Um, you can't provision enough power fast enough to uh, to keep up with the web scalers. So we're the largest owner of cloud-based uh, data centers in Europe. We have um, uh, over 28 you know, massive you know, public cloud campuses uh, that we build and operate. And um, every time we build something, it's fully leased within nine to 12 months. So the demand is vastly outpacing uh, the total amount of power availability in Europe, particularly in the, in the OZs that are in the AZs that are in big cities. So Europe, Europe has a power issue. It's not going away anytime soon. It's probably gonna get worse before it gets better. Are, are, are countries, are governments telling you to prepare for worse power problems in the winter? So you know what we're reading about it. Yes. Are they gonna affect their edge? Uh, Germany, we have that problem in Germany right now. So the grid is being held back in Germany. They're, they're reserving power. Uh, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, sort of the, the, uh, the Loudoun County of, of Germany is Offenbach, Germany. Um, and Offenbach has no power availability for probably the next 18 months. So if you're trying to light up capacity uh, in Germany's most important data center market, you won't get it for another two years. 
So that's kind of the, some of the challenges we're dealing with in, in Europe right now. That also, I mean, that sort of goes to some of the data localization challenges you might. Well, in Europe, we, we have to create a duplicate data set in every country. So um, when you're running a business like ours, uh, we have a business called Vantage uh, Data Centers there. This is the one that has the 28 cloud campuses. Yeah. Um, we're not only dealing with the overlay of the EU, but we're also dealing with the overlay of every country who wants to make sure that the data repository stays in the country and that there's a copy of everything that's done in that country. And Amazon and Microsoft and Google uh, have to go through this as well. So there's an extra layer of regulatory, uh, I would say, uh, that does slow you down a little bit there, but is it's there, more on our customers than it is on us. Is there right now a constraint in Germany be, uh, because you can't add to capacity? There is. I, I think if you were looking for 50 megawatts and you're a web scaler and you want to be in Offenbach, or, which is Frankfurt, um, you'll be told, get in line. You're going to wait. You're going to wait 18 months. So that's sort of a, a, an implication of data localization laws combined with this power problem. Correct. Uh, same thing in Zurich. Uh, we just lit up the last sort of 48 megawatts in Zurich, and we're being told, come back in two years. Um, and so we, you know, Zurich 1, 2, and 3, which is a massive cloud campus that we just built, it's fully leased, and, you know, we can't do anything with the next four data halls for a while. Wow. Um, one other thing, another, another issue, we were just, uh, we just had a panel on antitrust. And M&A has been a part mm -hmm. of uh, Digital Bridges growth strategy. Are there aspects of antitrust here or uh, in other countries that concern you that, that, um, you, know, that, you, that you think might affect your future growth? Well, I think in, in Asia, it's been pretty wide open. We don't really have a lot of regulatory, uh, there's not a regulatory overlay framework for the region. Obviously, here in the US and Canada, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty tightly regulated. Europe's the worst. Every deal that we have that we do in Europe goes to uh, if it goes for EU regulatory. Um, we just announced a, a significant transaction about three weeks ago with Deutsche Telekom. We're trying to explain to investors when we're going to close, and we tell them we don't know. They love that answer. Right. Uh, as a public company, you love telling people you don't know when you're going to close something. So our best guess is January, um, and that's sort of the EU overlay. And then with, with DT, we've got sort of the Austrian overlay and the Germany overlay. So there's, there's actually four regulatory approvals to get that deal done. And it's a joint venture between us and, and Deutsche Telekom for 43,000 towers. And it's a big deal. And we're expecting the German regulator to come back and say, you know, we're going to have to divest of some of those towers. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time on regulatory in Europe. And here in the US, it's, it's been pretty good. I, I think CFIUS has done a very good job. We, every transaction we do goes in for CFIUS approval. I think Treasury's done a, a good job, whether it was under Obama or Trump, dare I say, uh, or Biden. It's been, it's been pretty good, and it's been very transparent. We know exactly what they're looking for now. And um, I've been to CFIUS, I think, probably a dozen times in the last 15 years. And um, you know, it, it takes time, but it's always constructive. I don't think it's, it's destructive yet. Um, we'll start doing some questions, although we should do questions, live questions, because my phone keeps overheating. Um, <laughs> up here, so I'm having a little trouble with it. But here's one that I am able to read. Sure. Um, does Let's Talk Zio, which I don't know about. Zio, yeah. Zio. It's um, our fiber business. Uh, oh, oh, OK. Um, seems like they want to expand scope, but haven't seen much in terms of innovation there lately. What can we expect to see in coming years? Yeah, so on the product innovation side, we're spending a lot of time on uh, SD-WAN. So SD-WAN is sort of software-defined wide area networks, which is the ability to um, really use the cloud to dial up uh, incremental capacity for voice and data. Um, SD-WAN is kind of, I don't want to say it's the future of the company, but it's a very important product that we did not have when we bought the company. Um, one of the things when we did buy the business we said we would do is we'd go back to innovating again. Mm -hmm. And so SD-WAN was really important. We also acquired an E-rate platform. Uh, we're spending a lot of time on public education and private education and how we bring appropriate broadband services to universities and, and uh, in school districts. So that's something that's important to us. And then also we're in the midst of redesigning some of our long haul infrastructure. So creating lower latency routes between Europe and the US, uh, creating a couple of new transit, uh, transcontinental routes that are candidly old. Some of our fiber infrastructures now is coming up on 23 to 25 years old, believe it or not. Fiber does have a, a finite life to it. Um, we do think some of those. So some hold on a second. 
Um, the Fiber Broadband Association is, does a lot to tell us that you need fiber to future-proof, I and mean, you're telling us that it has a limited lifespan. Well, it does because it's <laughs> physically, it's glass, and it mm -hmm. ultimately ages, and the casing that's on the outside of it sometimes ages as well. Um, you get cuts, you get uh, acts of God, you get, you know, uh, SHIT happens, you know, it's a network, it's a living, breathing network, and some of the infrastructure that was put in place, some of the long haul infrastructure that's really vital to our economy was put in place in the, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s, and just like a cell tower has a useful life of 25 years, most people don't know this, but a suboceanic, suboceanic cables actually dissipate over 25 years. And so now what's happening is we're laying a lot of those new routes. Now we're using the existing routes, but we're overlaying new conduit, new suboceanic conduit, hmm. and it's really expensive. I mean, those routes take years and years to build. And um, a lot of those routes that were built by level three and, and some, of the, some of the RBOX are now aging out. So we do have an aging problem with some of the long haul infrastructure. And so at Zao, we're, we're rebuilding that. We're putting 200 million of CapEx every year back into the network. So we had a major network fortification uh, program we put in place that we didn't run around telling investors that had to happen, but it is essential for to, to stay at 5.9 standards. You gotta keep reinvesting in the network. What is the fiber market like right now? I mean, in, in its quarterly reports, uh, Corning touted the rising prices of fiber, um, and we know there's lots of demand for it. Do you, do you see that as an issue? Um, we do see it as an issue, and I think um, Corning's right to move prices up. Um, this isn't an infomercial for Corning, but we've <laughs> we've bought a lot of the, our, our Corning capacity out three years. We did that about a year and a half ago, and we'll go back to the table and, and sit back down with them again. And look, Verizon does the same thing, AT&T does the same thing, and um, my suspicion is the cost of fiber will go up, and um, Corning is our far and away our number one provider. And uh, uh, the, the fiber space is really competitive right now, Scott, super competitive. Um, do you think it's it's going to be a problem uh, it, is it going to affect the broadband subsidy pro uh, program? Is fiber scarce enough that it'll drive up prices sufficiently to, to, to delay things? Well, I think the, the actual cost of the fiber itself is pretty stable. So we, we have this sort of notion between supply chain and then execution. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we haven't had a real problem sourcing the fiber. Hmm. Um, what's interesting is at the end of fiber, you've got fiber because when you lay it, it's, it's called dark, which means you haven't lit it up yet. Most, I think most people in the room know that. But um, you do have to light it up on both ends, which requires optical light switching gear. That, actually, we're having a problem with. Interesting. So some of that componentry actually does come from China. Hmm. And it does come from places overseas. And so we can go lay a perfect low latency route between Dallas and Atlanta. But if we don't have the right optical light switching gear at the other end to light it up, it's going to remain dark uh, for the foreseeable future. So. It's beyond just fiber. I think the, uh, the cost side of the fiber business is, is okay. It's pretty stable. We're building somewhere around uh, $65,000 per route mile in terms of a, a low latency, high capacity route. I'd say when we bought the business, maybe that number was 58,000 two yeah. and a half years ago. So it really hasn't moved that demonstrably. But here's the problem. It comes back to labor. Finding the right people to actually micro trench and build those, those trenches is the problem. I can't. I literally can't keep up with the demand in terms of uh, how we build it today. Uh, right. Uh, how do you feel about the Buy America provisions? That must be difficult for you. It, it is difficult because some of these component some of these components are just not made here. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan Adelstein and I were talking about the the chips bill earlier, which I actually quite like. Mm -hmm. I think we do need to be not only energy dependent, but we need to be semiconductor independent. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of where this economy needs to go. Um, that's not firing a shot at our Asian partners that, that build that, but um, our reliance on that is just is entirely uh, too heavy. So I'd like to see us be uh, fully chip independent in 10 years. Uh, it won't happen, but I think that would be a, a step in the right direction. And certainly if, if we could focus on not just the steel and the fiber and the generators that fuel, fuel data centers, but thinking about other niche industries and specialized components, it would be good for industry to have a conversation with the government before they go out and they, they put these bills in place. I think some of my frustration is sometimes we, we, we go write legislation and we haven't brought industry into the room and say, where are your pain points? Um, because if, if, if you had taken the top you know, dozen digital infrastructure CEOs and sat them down with the people that wrote the broadband bill, you'd have a very different outcome. 
Um, we should take some questions. Uh, we have to, do, do we have a microphone? Oh, yep, it's, it's in the back. back. Okay, so if you have a question, raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm gonna keep asking questions. There's one over here. Yeah, um, I'll, oh, you had one back there too? Yeah, there's three. Okay, I can't, I don't know why I can't see me. Anyway, so somebody has the microphone, ask your question. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned lots of challenges, particularly workforce. Um, right now, there's hundreds of billions of dollars available for broadband in the United States even before the NTIA program that we heard a lot about uh, last night, do you see the municipal overbuilds that are kind of rapidly uh, building up around the country as creating a workforce challenge that by the time the rural money is available, there won't be enough workers to deploy in rural America because those companies will compete for the same workers, same switches, optical light gear that you mentioned with much bigger and potentially more lucrative projects in urban areas? So, um and sorry, your name? Oh, sorry, Evan. Sorry, hey, Evan. How are you? Um, so, Evan, I, I think you're spot on. Um, a lot of what he's talking about is a lot of municipalities are going out and they're they're overlaying and building broadband infrastructure and saying we want to control our pipes, just like we control our sewage, just like we control electrical transmission. And it's interesting. It is it is absorbing resources. It is a problem. We are competing for the same uh, for the same subcontractors. Um, I think when municipalities actually own this infrastructure and they find out actually hard it is to run it, um, they're probably going to put out RFPs to do private-public partnerships where we're going to have to come over and, and, and run the infrastructure. Uh, we've already seen that happen in, in one Midwest uh, uh, specific city that's asked us to come in and help them do it. I, I don't think municipalities should be in the business of, of laying fiber for the sake of just laying fiber. I, I think that's a bit misguided. Where municipalities need to help us is in permitting and helping us plan and ultimately accelerate the process of building out fiber infrastructure, small cell infrastructure, and ultimately where we're gonna put edge compute locations. The municipalities that, that have uh, very active um, planning and, and permitting are the ones that are, are, are the communities that are excelling. Um, the solution isn't just go dig a ditch and, and lay some fiber in and hope that the cable companies and the, and, the, and the traditional telcos are gonna lease your capacity. So we'll see how that plays out. I, I am, Evan, a little bit worried about that. I'm seeing that increasingly more municipalities are trying to get into the business, and I just don't understand if that's good business for them or not. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. I'm uh, Fiona Murray from MIT. Uh, you mentioned the investments, in, the investments and innovation that you're making. I wondered if you could say something about what you're seeing from startups and whether you're seeing enough of that. And if not, what should we be doing to try and increase that kind of innovation coming from the startup community? Yeah, thank you. Um, good question. So we felt like we weren't doing enough. So um, two years ago, we started a division inside of our business called uh, Ventures, DBRG Ventures. And so we hired the team out of Qualcomm Capital to go run that business unit for us. And so. Our overlay on that is, because we own all the infrastructure, inevitably we are, we are running into startups that are either, they're taking one rack in our data center or they're provisioning you know, uh, five strands or, or two circuits. And, and ultimately, some of those businesses would come to us and say, wait, you guys are an investor. Um, can you help us? And we said, well, we don't do that. We just do infrastructure. And then what we found out is we, we were missing a big opportunity to help entrepreneurs. And my background is, is, is entrepreneurship. My, 20 partners globally, half of them are entrepreneurs that used to run businesses. And so we're, we're, we're investing $500 million of new capital uh, into specifically into startups that are focused on enabling the digital economy. And we can do more. Um, and right now, the ventures world's a bit upside down. I think there's a lot of dislocation in terms of where that, that, that is and valuations are being reset. So the sand is shifting under our feet pretty fast. but. We remain very committed to deploying that $500 million of capital over the next two years. And uh, we've made four investments already into four different startups that are mostly so far on, on I'd say, two sort of core thematics. One has been around uh, private enterprise 5G networks and how do you ultimately use 5G to change enterprise and specifically how to create efficiencies and workflows. And then the other area we've been spending a lot of time on is AI. Um, that's an area that really fascinates us. and machine learning, um, autonomous vehicles, uh, autonomous shipping ports. These are use cases that we're deploying right now. And some with, with a high rate of failure so far, but some with some success. And I think it's going to take the next decade to really play out how AI impacts enterprise. 
So you'll, you'll see us investing a lot in, in AI-based applications that are impacting uh, enterprises. Yeah, over there. Go there and then there. <laughs> I'm Alan Rawl from Sidley Austin. Uh, what about cybersecurity? Um, you mentioned uh, chip independence, as, and I assume that there's a, a cybersecurity component to that, national security. But what do you see as your biggest risk being uh, really an essential part of communications critical infrastructure? The biggest risk, how do you interact with the U.S. government on that, and how does your global business complicate your ability to assure cybersecurity? Yep, big issue. Um, I'd say probably the, the, the second biggest issue today, Alan, in our data center practice globally um, we do provide cybersecurity. We provide the security of the facilities, the physical security of the facilities, believe it or not. We have um, security guards and, a, a, and, and multiple layers of, of, of security to get into the actual uh, data hall, and our customers demand that. We, we sort of build to their standards. Uh, we did just announce about two months ago we're buying a business called Switch out of Las Vegas. They're one of the largest providers of private cloud environments, so sort of the counter to public cloud. There we do a lot of work in a tier four and, and mostly tier five environment for the U.S. government. So um, we spend a lot of time servicing the government and making sure that they have incredibly uh, secure work environments. Um, ultimately, it is our customer's job to make sure their data stays secure, but there are certain things that we do at the physical layer of the infrastructure that really help secure that. And so, um, you know, we've We've, we've done a good job there. Once again, our, our, our sort of obligation to the customer is 5.9 standards in our tier three and tier four and tier five data centers. And our track record there is really strong. I think we've had maybe two network outages in, in eight years, which is pretty good. Um, and they do happen, network outages happen and cyber attacks happen every day on our data centers. Um, it's an area where I think the government sort of is trying to figure out what their role is and how far and how deep they go into the IT stack, and that'll be a debate that'll probably play out over the next 10 years. But my job is to keep the physical layer of the infrastructure very secure, and then the metaphysical layer is probably something that we'll be involved with over the next 10 years, and that'll be in our digital ventures group, by the way, where we're dealing with software-defined networks and, and building companies that are focused on, on cybersecurity in that metaphysical layer between the cloud and between the physical infrastructure. Uh, one last question. Hi, thank you. My name is Ruth Berry. I'm with the Department of State. Um, as you know, the U.S. government has been very focused on promoting the use of trustworthy telecommunications uh, network and equipment around the world. And so my question is for you, given your global operations, how can the U.S. government better partner with companies, U.S. companies who are providing uh, telecommunications networks, data centers, et cetera, around the world? Uh, great question. And actually, a lot of our investors who are U.S. pension funds ask us the same question. Um, so really it's, it's become a, the, the war there is in wireless, first and foremost. Um, I think across the globe today, less than 5% of the uh, network base stations are Huawei and the rest is in the, in the green list. And so we, we, we put a lot of emphasis in the facilities that we build in working with, you know, American uh, enterprises and American OEMs. And we can do that here in North America, and we do that principally in Latin America. It gets harder in Europe, and it gets a lot harder in Asia. Um, now, the, the ultimate question is, how can commerce help you know, our, our customers uh, get access to lower cost equipment? Because the reality is, the, the, the way Huawei had gained prominence was 0% you know, financing for 10 years, which was all backed by the Chinese government. So the only way that we gain market share in predominantly in optical light switching gear and base stations is, is the U.S. federal government willing to finance and help finance innovation in this country? That's where it starts. And the only way we can be competitive is if you're providing to the AT&Ts and the Deutsche Telekoms of the world low cost of financing. That's the game. Um, if we're just sort of cutting right through the, the sort of substance of the matter. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. I have a lot of, lot of opinions on this. Great question. All right, I think we've got to wrap it up and move on. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. This is really Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and uh, now we're going to move on to learning about Web3. Um, and so that panel should come up. Um, also, uh, after that, if you want to go hiking um, with a group, uh, Greg Rostin will lead uh, a, a hike to the, on the Ute Trail, which is really hard. So, you know, 
there's no shame in going part way up and coming back down. At least that's what they told me when I couldn't go all the way up. If it's, if it's raining, then there'll be a, a different, more easier trail. But meet at 2.30 in the St. Regis lobby if you want to do that.